This is a problem known as the Kakea problem. What you do is you start with a triangle, which is here, and you divide it up into, uh, well, in the picture, eight sub-triangles. That's a rather mathematical word, I apologize for that. But anyway, eight tall, thin triangles that uh, go up to make the big triangle. Um, and mathematicians would, would say, well, eight equals n or something. So it doesn't matter that it's eight. And what you're trying to do is to take these smaller triangles and slide them around in such a way that they overlap with each other. And you want to make them overlap with each other in such a way that the triangles take up as little space as possible. Space is expensive, but you're allowed to overlap. And there's a, here's a, the pictures show a way you can do it, which is you take them in pairs, and then you slide the pairs together. That's in the first step. And then you take pairs of these pairs and slide those together. That gets you to here. And then you take pairs of these now quadruples, slide those together, and you get a funny sort of plant-like shape that uh, has smaller area than the original triangle because you've got all this overlap. Now, it turns out that if you're clever enough, you can make the area as small as you like of the overlap. If you have two to the n pieces, which to the layperson is a very, very large number, if n is at all large, then you can make the area go down to 1 over n. For example, if you wanted the area to be, say, 10% of the original area, you'd, you'd need uh, round about 1,000 pieces. If you wanted it to be 1% of the original area, you'd need round about a million pieces. So you have to go, it has to be pretty big. Did I mean, oh, sorry, 5% sorry, would be a million, I beg your pardon. Um, now that's not actually the, the real uh, problem that I want to discuss, but it is a useful background to it, because the real problem is the natural three-dimensional generalization of that problem. So what would be this three-dimensional generalization? Instead of taking a triangle, you take a pyramid. And instead of dividing it into little triangles, you divide it into tall, thin, little pyramids. Here I've got it divided into nine little pyramids. And uh, then you're allowed to slide those around. Now they overlap in space, so to speak. And you want to make the volume, rather than the area, as small as possible. Well, I decided that it was not a good idea to draw nine overlapping cones. I restricted myself to four. But in reality, one wants to do nine. Uh, and again, for mathematicians here, actually, you want to go beyond three dimensions and uh, go up to n. The, the big open question here is, whereas in two dimensions you needed um, a huge number of pieces to get the area to go down, maybe that's not so true in three or more dimensions. It's actually suspected that you do need a lot of pieces, <laughs> but nobody knows how to prove it. Um, I'll just show you a very quick picture, just because I've got it. There. That might be a, where you divide the base of the pyramid into many more pieces, uh, make cones out of them, and try to uh, slide them about to get the area as small as possible. I think this picture is a better one to leave. And then problem number four. I'm not going to say much about this because it's very, very much not my ex uh, area of expertise, but partial differential equations as mathematicians will know, are absolutely fundamental to physics. If you want to model anything, more or less, you come up with a partial differential equation. And what you'd like to know about it is things like, does it have solutions? If so, are those solutions smooth? How do they behave? Do they blow up after a certain amount of time? And so on. And they describe phenomena such as uh, wave functions, the flow of heat, waves, the motion of fluids, you name it. It's got a partial differential equation to describe it. Um, and then there are linear ones. Those are sort of relatively simple, although there are plenty, plenty that's not known about them. And then there are nonlinear ones, which are, in some contexts, more realistic, but much, much harder to analyze. So I haven't asked a specific question here. There are lots and lots of questions. Um, now, you may ask, why did I choose those four rather different-looking problems? You may have guessed the answer if you don't know it, uh, which is that they're not as different as they look. In fact, there are very close links um, between them. So you can get from arithmetic progressions in primes to partial differential equations by a sequence of links. Now, if you really want to know about this, what you have to do is come here tomorrow and listen to Terence Tao, who will be talking about it in some detail. But let me just describe what one or two of these links are like. Um, if you're looking at arithmetic progressions of primes, it's very natural, and Erdos and Turan did this, to generalize the question to arithmetic progressions in more general sorts of sets. That led to a very famous theorem of Semiradi, who solved the conjecture of Erdos and Turan. As an aside, 
that led to important advances in ergodic theory, which is a totally different branch of maths and surprised everybody. I was thinking about a different approach to Semiradis theorem and came up with a, a lemma, which was a sort of an improvement of the uh, balog semiradis theorem, which I talked about a little earlier. Jean Bourguin noticed that he could use that lemma to improve the best known um, answer so far for the Kakea problem, the one about sliding uh, cones about. Actually, I have to admit that uh, Nets Katz and Terence Tau found a way of uh, getting an even better improvement not using the lemma that I talked about. But that's the way mathematics progresses, I think, and uh, I don't think that completely invalidates the link. Uh, Bourguin had earlier proved that uh, the Kakea problem had intimate connections with the distribution of the zeros of the Riemann zeta function, intimately itself connected with the distribution of prime numbers, as Riemann showed us, which gets you full circle back to arithmetic progressions in primes, because you need to know about the distribution of primes, or you may need to, actually. <laughs> And uh, the Kakea problem is also very closely connected to conjectures in harmonic analysis, which themselves you need for the analysis of certain partial differential equations. And that's what Terence Tyler will be talking about, which is, of course, important for physics. Now, I'm not going to claim that uh, thinking about arithmetic progressions of primes directly helps physics or something like that. But nevertheless, there's this huge interconnected web of knowledge, and you just can't afford to uh, break bits off it. That would be my main message. So as a final cautionary tale for the hypothetical finance minister, let me also demonstrate that problems that look like nothing but fun and games can also turn out to be of direct practical importance after all. I mean, not theory sort of provides an example of that, but here's an even more obvious example, I would say. Timetabling. So this is something that uh, people come across, come across from time to time. I can't, can't call it an impractical uh, thing to think about. Let's imagine that we're, let's say, it doesn't have to be this, but let's imagine that we're trying to uh, organize some exams. And so we've got uh, seven candidates, numbered one to seven, eight papers, one to, uh, so A to H. So candidate, each candidate takes either two or three papers. Candidate one wants to take paper A, C, and H. Candidate two takes B and D and so on and so forth. The question is, we've got a rather expensive examination hall to book. We've got to hire a rather expensive hall. We don't want to use it for more paper or more sittings than necessary. So how many sittings do we need? Well, candidate, a, candidate one is taking three papers. So there must be at least three sittings. But there's nothing to say that you couldn't have two different papers going on in the hall at the same time. So how are we going to solve this? Well, let's just think about which papers could coincide with each other and which ones couldn't. For example, we know we better not have paper A at the same time as paper C because then poor old candidate number one